Hello, I'm Lynette Clementson, Director of Wallace House, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for our Eisendraft Symposium on International Journalism. I'd like to start by thanking our co-sponsors for today's event, the Knight Foundation, Michigan Radio, the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, the Center for Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies, Detroit Public Television, and PBS Books. We've got a lot to talk about in one hour, and we welcome your engagement with this discussion. We ask that you use um, the chat function to put your questions in through YouTube, or you can tweet us using at Wallace House. We'll have people following the conversation and taking your questions. The Eisendrath Symposium is an event we hold every year to honor Charles Eisendrath, who for 30 years directed Wallace House and who built international journalism deep into the fabric of our programs. We honor Charles today with this conversation, devastation in Ukraine and the consequences of engagement. I'd like to start our conversation today by welcoming Charles to say a few words. When I was asked uh, what I would like to be remembered with in the, in the fellowships, it took me five seconds to answer something about international reporting. That's where most of my career was focused, often in places like Biafra, like Santiago de Chile, like Buenos Aires, um, and very much like the Ukraine right now, uh, places that didn't get much attention unless there was a war going on. It's a huge honor to be here with you and I'd be fascinated to hear what we're gonna learn. Thank you, Charles. And it's a pleasure to honor you and everything you've given us to build on at Wallace House. I'd like to start by uh, introducing our very distinguished panel today. First is Simon Ostrovsky. Simon is a, a 2021-22 Knight Wallace Reporting Fellow. Uh, just back from Ukraine in the region. He's a special correspondent for PBS NewsHour and the New York Times. He's an investigative journalist best known for his coverage of the Crimea crisis and the war in Eastern Ukraine for which he was nominated for two Emmys. Simon won a DuPont Award from Columbia University in 2015 for his Selfie Soldiers documentary, which tracked Russian soldiers in Ukraine through their social media posts. He also won an Emmy Award in 2014 as a producer of Vice on HBO. Um, Simon has covered extensively the countries of the former Soviet Union, where he witnessed five revolutions and four wars. He served as South Caucasus Bureau Chief for the uh, Agence France Press and as an investigative reporter at CNN. His work has also appeared on the BBC, CBS News, and 60 Minutes. Simon will finish this conversation today and hopefully join us in Ann Arbor after weeks of covering this crisis. Simon, thank you for joining us. Really glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Next, we have Elena Milashina. Elena was a Knight Wallace Fellow in 2009-10. She is a dear friend of the program and uh, a much honored investigative journalist with Novaya Gazeta, Russia's last remaining independent newspaper. Novaya Gazeta, as you may know, uh, the, the editor, executive editor, Dmitry Muratov was awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize in December. Uh, and Novaya Gazeta had been holding on in this crisis before it ceased publication in response to threats from the Putin regime just weeks ago. Elena investigates and brings attention to accounts of enforced disappearances, arbitrary detentions, extrajudicial executions, torture, and persecutions. Uh, she has covered women's rights and human rights in Chechnya and, and beyond. Elena exposed a major crackdown on gay men in Chechnya in the spring of 2017. She's investigated the catastrophe of the Kursk submarine, a hostage crisis in Moscow and, Belsan, and Beslan, she has documented atrocities on both sides during the 2008 Russia-Georgia conflict. And we should note that Elena has repeatedly received death threats from the Chechen authorities. She's actually joining us today from an undisclosed location for her own security. We hope that she will be joining us in Ann Arbor in the next year as well. Elena is the recipient of the Human Rights Watch, Allison. Des Forges Award for Extraordinary Activism and the International Women of Courage Award. 
Elena, it's always wonderful to see you. Thank you for doing this with us today. Thank you for uh, inviting me and for having me here today with you. Thank you. And, and, and we have joining us from the university, uh, Professor Ronald Suni. He's the William H. Sewell Jr. Distinguished University Professor of History and Professor of Political Science at the University of Michigan, an Emeritus Professor of Political Science and History at the University of Chicago, the grandson of a composer and ethnomusicologist, Grigor, I'm going to mess up this, this name, Ron, uh, your, your oh, yeah. grandfather. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and a graduate of the Swarthmore College and Columbia University. He taught at Oberlin as a visiting professor of history at the University of California, Irvine and Stanford University. He's also served as senior researcher at the National Research University High, uh, Higher School of Economics, St. Petersburg. He was the first holder of the Alex Manoogian Chair in Modern Ar Armenian History at the University of Michigan. And we're so glad to have him here with us today. Thank you, Professor Suni. It's not only a pleasure, but it's an honor to be with these distinguished journalists. Well, we have so much to cover in one hour. And Simon, I'd like to start with you. You've been on the ground reporting for PBS NewsHour and the New York Times. Uh, all over the region. You, you have just come back. As we meet today, Russia seems to be entering um, its, its Eastern offensive, as, as has been promised. There were several strikes uh, overnight. And if you could just catch, up, catch us up on what's happening on the ground as you understand it now. Well, that's right. I've been covering the uh, refugee crisis uh, for the New York Times, uh, initially from Poland and then Moldova. And then about two and a half weeks ago, I went into Ukraine itself and spent most of my time in Kiev and the areas around Kiev, uh, where the Russian uh, forces had actually withdrawn from um, just days before my arrival. And it was a really big story, as I'm sure all of you remember, because suddenly it became possible to find out what it was like to live under Russian occupation for that month, that month and a week um, that Russia occupied various areas all the way down from the northern border with Belarus and Russia, um, up to the very doorstep of the capital Kiev in Irpin and Bucha, which is only, you know, about 15 kilometers away from the center of the city. Um, since then, uh, the activity, as you said, has been mostly focused in the south and in the east, and the Ukrainian government has been warning for a couple of weeks now that the next phase of the war is going to be in the Donbass, in eastern Ukraine, where in fact the war started back in 2014 after the annexation of uh, Crimea. So there's nothing new there. The war in the East has been going on for a long time, but now it's in an expanded territory. And while everybody has been expecting an offensive from Russia, um, what they weren't expecting is an early counter offensive from Ukraine. And it seems that Ukrainian forces have actually preempted Russia's plans to regroup in that area by trying to cut off an area that the Russians already hold called Izum uh, in the Kharkiv region. Um, near the Donbass. So fighting has been ongoing there. It's been stepping up. And I spoke with the foreign minister of Ukraine uh, last week, Dmitry Kuleba, asking him whether a negotiated solution was possible with Russia. And what he told me was that neither Russia nor Ukraine at this time are prepared to negotiate until they know what the outcome of the fight in the Donbass is and where each country stands in terms of uh, its uh, forces' success or failures uh, in Ukraine. So we're looking forward, obviously, to this war ending, but it seems that neither side is prepared to get down to the negotiating table just yet because they, they don't know what the stakes are at this moment yet either. And Simon, I want to ask you just about the flow of information. It's worth sharing with our audience that when you came to the Knight Wallace Fellowship this year, your project as a Knight Wallace Reporting Fellow for this academic year was to look at misinformation and the global spread of misinformation and, and, and how uh, conspiracy theories and strong threads of disinformation make their way from country to country. And you had already been traveling in the region before this war started. You had done a series of reports from Estonia. Uh, and 
the start of the war thrust you into a very active reporting of the information systems that you had been looking at for the first several months of the fellowship. Um, I think we're going to put in the chat a story that you had published in the New York Times last week about how Russian disinformation spreads beyond its borders. Can you talk about the role of disinformation in this war, even as we're consuming constant news of this conflict here in the United States, there are many people in the region who, because of Russian propaganda, don't see this as a war or not even hearing the word war used. Absolutely. I mean, I've been following Russian disinformation for a very long time in my career. And in fact, the first piece that I did for um, the uh, Knight Wallace Fellowship was actually in Estonia back in December looking at how the Estonian government, which is one of the countries that recognized this as a a potent potent threat early on, is dealing with the issue. And over there, they've decided to create their own Russian language outlet inside Estonia that would uh, serve uh, Russian-speaking Estonians, which is something that other countries in the Baltic states haven't done, and I have to say Ukraine itself hasn't done. And I think that that's a big mistake. Um, More recently for the New York Times video team, we went to Transnistria, which is a region perhaps many people haven't heard of. It's a very small sliver of the country of Moldova that is between Moldova and Ukraine itself. So, you know, it has a very long border with Ukraine and it's very pro-Russian because it's been backed by Russia ever since it broke away from Moldova de facto in 1992. So people there consume a lot of Russian media. Um, They watch all of the state television networks and we decided as a team that it would be interesting to go there to find out um, what people's view of the war in Ukraine is when they live in this sort of media ecosystem that is created by Russia. And we thought it was a particularly interesting time to go there because it's so difficult to actually do that kind of work in Russia today where there are laws now where speaking out against the war, for example, or even calling the war a war could land you in jail. Um, So Transnistria sort of was this kind of halfway house where we actually didn't know going in how affected people were because they actually, they're close enough to Ukraine to get Ukrainian television, but they also watch a lot of Russian uh, television. And what we found was that their view Um, of events in Ukraine is sort of like, you know, it's Alice in Wonderland. It's through the looking glass. Um, They have a completely opposite perception of what is happening there, even though they live so close um, to Ukraine. So you, you would think that having actual sources within your family, because a lot of them have family members in Ukraine, would give you a realistic view. The truth is no. If you spend most of your time Um, watching outlets like uh, Rasia 24 or Channel 1 News from Russia, then you will believe that Russia was justified in starting its, quote, special military operation in Ukraine because Russia needed to get rid of the so-called biological weapons that were being allegedly developed there with the help of the United States. Um, Russia needed to go in to help get rid of the alleged dirty bombs, that the nuclear dirty bombs that Ukraine was producing. Um, Russia needed, moreover, uh, according to these news reports that people watch in Transnistria, to stop the ultranationalism and the fascism that is claimed to be taking over the country and the attacks on Russian speakers that Russia has been uh, alleging have been taking place for a very long time. And Simon, the the term, I was surprised to hear in in your piece the term that that seemed to be used to describe this, this, this particular justification as denazification that 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 the russian position is that that the quote special operation is to rid uh ukraine of of nazis i mean that's something that putin said himself i think the night uh or the day before that uh, russia went into ukraine with its full-scale invasion um was that the primary goal was to denazify the country which is a statement that is, you know, completely ridiculous on its face, um, simply because the president of Ukraine, who was elected with 73% uh, of popular support, is 
a Russian speaker um, with a Jewish background, which is less significant. But the fact that he's a Russian speaker, you know, puts the lie to the statement that in charge of Ukraine are Ukraine ethnic Ukrainian ultra-nationalists who want to eradicate the Russian-speaking population. And that's actually something that I talked about with the people that I met in Transnistria. I asked them, well, is Zelensky a nationalist in your view? In their view, he is. And it's completely, um, you know, it's completely false. Um, Elena, I want to, to bring you in because the consequences of misinformation and propaganda have hit you and your news organization and other news independent news organizations directly uh, in a very dangerous way. Um, and and it's worth saying that Novaya Gazeta has been standing up against repression and control of information for years. And I think that even the, for those of us who follow uh, journalism and news organization, even when this started and Putin uh, passed the law threatening 15 years in prison for news organizations that used the term war uh, or and didn't use, use the approved language um, of, of the administration, I think people thought, well, Novaya Gazeta will hold on. And you, and you did hold on for weeks uh, until ceasing publication uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Can you, can you talk about your impression of how this has all built to this point and, uh, and, and the consequences of this control? Well, now uh, it's pretty clear the Russian government uh, uh, was getting ready to this war uh, for many years. Uh, and one of the uh, biggest threat for them, as they consider, is the true information. Uh, and uh, uh, if we were cynical enough to believe, because the majority of Russian people didn't believe that the war could start in Ukraine, that Russia can attack Ukraine, and uh, on 24th of February, uh, when actually the war began, uh, uh, we all were a lot of people, a lot of experts and a lot of usual Russians, people were saying that they, well, they are, were stupid enough not to believe the information that uh, we were receiving from the West, that Russia is going to start the war. But uh, um, we were smart enough and cynical enough to to... To, to understand the real nature of our authorities, we would uh, pay attention, of course, to all those uh, uh, aggressive actions against media and the uh, NGO that uh, Russian authorities took last year, because the whole last year, beginning uh, with the, uh, putting in jail uh, Mr. Navalny, um, famous Russian uh, opposition leader and who was poisoned uh, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, actually, uh, with the Navichok weapon. Uh, it's a chemical uh, weapon uh, that was used, obviously, by Russian authorities uh, and secret service. So when they put him in jail and they started to close one by one media outlets, uh, we still couldn't connect it with the plan of war that Russia had in mind already, Russian authorities had in mind already. Back then, I was not sure, and I was saying it in, in, in openly in interview, that we would survive because everybody was, every media outlet, small and big enough, was closing or journalists were put on the list of foreign agents uh, uh, and so on that we would survive. But uh, when the war actually started on 24th of February, there was, it looks like there was already a plan that uh, of, of restrict measures that would bring us to this point where we don't have free media, uh, professional media, traditional media uh, in Russia anymore. And my newspaper was the last newspaper, independent newspaper that were, uh, survived for 36 years 
36 days uh, since 24th of February, and then we had to stop our publications because uh, we we did it ourselves. It was our initiative, but we received two um, letters from uh, Russian authorities, and the third letter uh, of that kind uh, actually uh, would lead us to lose the um, registration license so we uh, understood the signal very clearly and we had to stop publications because my editor-in-chief still believes that he can keep the newspaper uh, alive and when the special operation will end and I don't think it will happen soon uh, we would we would be able to operate again I don't believe in this anymore I think it was the end of free media of, of in Russia when uh, the president is Mr. Putin. And even for you, I remember talking to you uh, a month ago and saying, even for you who have, you've covered Putin for so many years, that some of this has been surprising, the depth of, the depth of this and the sabotage inside uh, has has been surprising even for you who who have covering him yes uh well um uh, you see last year was the second year of covid situation and uh, the globally it was very hard and for Russia also, but Russia uh, spent the last year with, and ended the last year with a very good economical uh, results and uh, the situation was recovering uh, very good uh, in all terms and the, 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 the economical situation, uh, uh, other situation, well, we're not taking the situation with the freedoms, it was uh, harsh last year was harsh but in general there was a normal life uh, um, and like I said nobody in my country a majority like 99 percent of people living in Russia wouldn't even believe those uh, uh, messages that we were receiving from the West security service and uh, Western leaders who were come to Russia and uh, ask Putin and talk to Putin not to start the war. We were laughing at it and we wouldn't believe that it was possible. Uh, yeah, it was, it, it kind of shows that uh, we and the Russian authorities, like we, usual Russian people and Russian authorities, were living in different realities and we wouldn't really... Uh, get for this war and now the situation is changing and uh, i think a russian authorities has uh, a support from russian uh, uh population for this war uh is this support big or not big it's a question uh but um but like i said uh 23rd of February was the day where nobody in Russia would believe that uh, on 24th, the Russian army would cross the Ukrainian border and would do these things that the Russian soldiers done there. And, and as Simon mentioned, uh, most people have relatives in Ukraine. You have- 11 million of Russian people has relatives in Ukraine and me too. And, and yeah, so my literally... parents live on the border with Ukraine. Uh, we, they live in Belgorod. Uh, it's 30 kilometers from Kharkov. And they, uh, they live uh, very close to the airport. And uh, already uh, two months, they listen the how the, the plans flying to bomb the Ukrainian. But Kharkov... Uh, is very close to um, people in Belgorod, very even much more close than Moscow. Uh, a lot of Ukrainians live here. Uh, the connections are very tight, and uh, um, 
what I've heard from my parents and from friends from Belgorod, the, the city is kind of shocked also. But it's not all the city. Again, I can talk uh, on behalf of the majority of population of Russia. It's what I can hear from my circle. And uh, 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 I don't see this big support for the war. Uh, people still shocked. They, they just it looks like they don't understand what is happening. And so let's bring in, in Professor Suni. How, how, how do we understand this historically and how, how we got to this point? Uh, and then I want to talk about the consequences. You know, we I think we talk about things like like gas prices in the United States, where the consequences are so much more than than the price of filling up a tank. And so, um, so Professor Suni, how, how do we understand this in context? Listening to Elena, particularly the confusion of people, the, the fact that it's difficult to comprehend why this thing happened. What was Putin thinking? Because all, all rationality would have said, okay, make threats if you want, you know, Rattle your swords, but cross the border and fight Ukraine when, in fact, you believe that Ukrainians and Russians are one people. They're certainly related by language, by culture, by coexistence for centuries. But you know, and Putin knows, that Ukraine is a separate nation. Uh, it's a state of its own with which Putin himself has made agreements over the last 20 years and fought a war. So... These things didn't make any sense at all. And that's why, as Simon pointed out, even in a place like Transnistria, where they could have access to more media, people still believe these fictions, these fantasies that are being propagated. Uh, and they had to create weird uh, kind of con concoctions of views like that the Ukrainian government are Nazis because Nazis are a powerful metaphor, a, a, a sense of danger that the Soviet Union fought in World War II and basically won the war in, in Europe uh, for, for the West. So, you know, these are powerful things. But if you try to find out what's really going on, what, what would be the motivation, then we're a little bit confused. I thought before February 24th, I had a fairly clear idea and I thought there was a way to prevent war. I believed that uh, the West had created a condition with the expansion of NATO that had created in Putin's mind, in his isolation, in his own self-telling of what was going on, a sense of existential threat. I don't think there was an existential threat, but that expansion and the arming of, of uh, Eastern Europe and increasingly Ukraine was something that that frightened him and frightened indeed many Russians who thought and still probably think many of them that the West is basically hostile to Russia as it's been sort of historically. So that was one explanation. But even if you have a sense of threat, that doesn't mean mechanically, automatically, that leads to invasion. Mm. That is, there's all kinds of alternatives. Uh, there's negotiation, there's discussion, uh, there's compromise that can be made. And that path wasn't taken. And so there's an alternative, an alternative interpretation that since February 24th, and I regret this has occurred, is more powerfully taken hold. And that is that Putin is either irrational. I don't think that's true. I think he's a realpolitik. He's thinking in real, uh, realpolitik terms, but he's exaggerated the dangers and threats that he feels from the West in a kind of almost paranoid sense. That Putin is a fascist and people compare him to Hitler or they look at Eurasianism or all the various right-wing philosophies that go on in Russia to try to explain that he wants to create a new empire, uh, a new Soviet Union or whatever. And that, that rhetoric has become increasingly powerful and popular in the West. I'm going to try to say what I think, which might combine the two. I, I take something I'll call a radical middle position. 
And that is that Putin had warned since February 2007 in his famous Munich speech that he was upset by the dominance of what the West celebrates as the liberal world order, the way peace has been kept generally between the great powers and in Europe since World War II, not discussing the various wars in other places, the uh, unilateral invasions by the United States of several countries and so forth. But peace had, had been kept, at least in Europe. Uh, and Putin so, saw that as a way in which the USA as a great unipower dominated the world. And he wanted to change that. And probably there are other great powers like China, certainly maybe India uh, and others, Iran, that want to think about the world in a different way with many centers, right? And so there's a kind of global sort of standoff between uh, the powerful liberal world order dominated by the United States and these what you might call revisionist powers who want to break up the status quo, who want to shake things up. And in a funny way, Ukraine and the war in Ukraine is in my mind less about Russians and Ukrainians who really are a complexly intertwined group, uh, two nations, then it is about this more global struggle of who's going to dominate. Mm -hmm. Which order in the world is ultimately going to end up on top? And as Simon pointed out, we don't know. The Minister of Fo Foreign Affairs in Ukraine doesn't know. It's The deck has been not shuffled, but thrown up in the air. And it's going to land as a result of whether or not these incredibly courageous Ukrainians, outnumbered as they are, can in fact hold the Russians back and achieve some kind of victory or put such a high price on the Russian invasion that the Russians will eventually stop and make concessions. And, and, and if it is, as you lay out convincingly, a larger struggle between uh, two different models of a, of a world order and, and this this sort of small, noble, underarmed force in Ukraine fighting on behalf of, 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 of the world um, and what they represent. What is then the responsibility of the rest of the West to engage, you know, we've, we've just recently started hearing the word genocide being used for all its complexity, a very hard term to um, have stick there. There's arms, but but the level, the, the, the consequences of engaging fully in this struggle are great. And so, and so how do you, how do you anticipate the United States and uh, and and other NATO powers? Is there any way through this that that doesn't lead to further broader devastation? The Russians and the way they're carrying on this war, which is what I would call a war of terror. And Simon knows this better than all of us, but we can see what's going on in the news. Uh, it's against civilians. It's against urban populations. Uh, atrocities have been carried out. The uh, rules of engagement seem to be very loose and people, uh, Russian soldiers have carried out things that are, are definitely war crimes. Whether they come from the top or from renegade groups, we see what's happening and it isn't stopping. And this makes it very difficult to have a negotiation, to have concessions, et cetera. So th th this is, that's the real situation that we're in. At the same time, there are rhetorics which are characterizing the war that themselves will make negotiation and off-ramps, as we were calling them, more difficult. So we have on the Russian side this idea of the fantasy of Nazism, Ukrainians and Russians being one people, the Ukrainians not being a real nation, the state of Ukraine created somehow by Lenin uh, in 1922, something like that. And on the Western side, Increasingly, the rhetoric is being uh, ramped up. 
So now it's a struggle uh, over autocracies versus democracies. Hmm. Now it's very difficult if that's what you're negotiating to think about uh, if you're proposing that as a framework to make concessions, right? It's like the Cold War again. Uh, once you create these rhetorics and the other side is seen as malevolent, so malevolent that you can't really make concessions, again, you're closing doors. Now, the, the West in this particular case is fighting a much more noble struggle without question, as is Ukraine. And it's certainly correct that we do everything possible to bolster that defense against what is definitely a war crime, a war of aggression unprovoked by the Russian side, by Putin himself. I see this more as Putin's war than Russians, Russia's war. Mm -hmm. But my Ukrainian friends have been writing to me, criticizing me for saying this is Putin's war. It's Russia's war. Now, Elena, you can see how dangerous that is. Because we know, having lived in Russia, that there are many Russians, as there are many U.S. Americans. And there are huge numbers, hundreds of thousands of Russians, who have fled the country because they don't see future. We're all living in a kind of condition of despair uh, in Russia. It may be that this morning, as Levada Institute reported, that 80% of Russians support the war. Oh, really? Well, first of all, if your country's at war, people automatically support the country. People supported the war in Vietnam in America, even after the Tet Offensive, and it was clear that the, the Vietnamese uh, communists would win. But, uh, and can they really freely say how they feel? I think Elena put it very eloquently. It's confusion. And in their hearts, these people didn't want war, didn't expect war, and would not have they, the kind of information that Simon and Elena and others are trying to bring to them at all support this war. And so I see eventually, I, by the way, see this, first of all, as the end of Putin. It won't be immediate, but he's, he's made a blunder, an incredible miscalculation, and eventually he will either step aside, going to be difficult since he's now being made a, a war criminal, uh, and, and, or, or there'll be a coup of some kind, men with guns, closer to him at home. But when that happens, and if it can happen in a country where there's not a very strong organized opposition, that's hard to say. The one other thing I'd say, I know I'm taking too much time and I don't want to do that, is let's be a little bit careful with the term genocide. I wrote a book called They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, a history of the Armenian genocide, and I struggled over this term. Genocide is used in two ways. One, it's used as a a, a term in international law. And it means it happens when a government, or I guess a group of people, if you like, but a government intentionally seeks to destroy a cultural, religious, ethnic group. Uh, and I don't think that's happening. I think uh, the second way it's used, more polemically, is a political use of the term. When there are mass atrocities, when there are mass killings, and often based on ethnic uh, um, characteristics. When there is ethnic cleansing, which is not quite genocide, uh, then the term is used, I think, a little bit too promiscuously because it has such power. Mm -hmm. Look at the words that are being used. Genocide, fascism, Nazis, autocracy, free the free world. In that context, I think it's going to be very hard until a lot more people suffer and die before these two sides come together. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I want to I make want to time, time for questions. Um, and I, I wanted to just, I saw both Elena and Simon, your eyebrows both go up almost simultaneously when, when Professor Suni mentioned the end of Putin. Uh, oh. and, and I would, I would like you both to just Respond, I, Elena. Is that something that is? That I is completely more... agree with with Ron in this uh, situation because, you know, uh, discussing the situation from the point of uh, free information and killing this free information uh, in Russia for many many years. Remember, Lynette, when I was on fellowship and I was 
uh, house in 2009-2010, I began my repre presentation with the words that the first word that Putin announced when he took the president chair was the word to free media. This war has a consequences and obviously had these consequences in this situation in particular because it, it comes very, very clear now that it was a big misunderstanding uh, in uh, uh, about the situation in Russian army. And we were forbidden for years to write uh, about the corruption in Russian army because uh, uh, we could get uh, uh, to the jail as a spice. And we have a lot of presidents like this when journalists go to prison because they were writing about the situation in Rami. And at the end, nobody is writing and nobody knows. Uh, 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 nobody knew actually the, the situation in Russian army w uh, b before the invasion to Ukraine. And now um, a lot of people in uh, Russian high level generals uh, questioned by Russian Secret Service where they put money and why uh, the situation is that bad and the other situation is that uh, that connected to this uh, um, fight with free media when you lose any uh, connection to reality with, with reality and you don't understand what's going on the secret service uh, people who were telling uh, obviously uh, uh, to uh, Russian authorities that uh, it would be really easy to take over the Ukraine because Ukrainian people would love to uh, when Russian comes and free them from whatever, Nazi or something like that. Stupid <laughs> thing. But, uh, uh, and, and the Russian authorities believe this because they just put a lot of money for those, all those years in the propaganda like Russian Russia Today, a famous Russian uh, media, uh, state media uh, that was built uh, stations all over the world in, in US and uh, uh, in Europe and a lot of Russian speaker, um, Russian speakers would watch this and it became very influential. And I think uh, that what partly happened, why, why this crazy situation actually started, uh, uh, and Putin uh, truly believed in the fake news that he created himself. Hmm. It's one of the situations when I think it's the end of regime because the regime doesn't have connections with the reality. And uh, it behaves in a way... Uh, uh, in, in, in a way that uh, will end very badly for the regime and for Putin himself. And yes, I, I truly believe that the situation is like this now. Putin can't uh, get away right now from Ukraine uh, and can continue the negotiations because he woke up in Russia uh, a real fascism. Uh, uh, what we call uh, a very, a very awful th bunch of people, and there are a lot of that kind of people who uh, demand from Putin to go to the war till the last man in Russia, and uh, if he is not going to do this, they would kill him or take him away. Uh, uh, and every person who is against the war, like my editor-in-chief, uh, Dmitry Muratov, they consider those people enemies and they're going to fight and even kill those people. Uh, uh, so it's from one side, Putin can't stop the war right now and he can't win this war. Uh, not in terms, I mean, we have still big army, a lot of techniques, a lot of tanks and so on. But the price of this, uh, even victory, if we take like south of Ukraine, uh, if we might take it, uh, consider the uh, situation with the Russian army, the price of this would be so high that the regime and Putin won't survive it. So mm -hmm. yes, I'm totally agree with Ron. It's the the beginning of the real end, like of the regime and Putin himself. And I guess just the question is how much suffering and destruction before the end. Yeah. 
uh, I'm very afraid of the battle that is every every side is getting ready because it would be a huge real like for the two battle and a lot of people would die <sighs> and it's just I can't stand the sort of it even yeah yeah I wanted to bring in uh, questions from from our viewers and Simon uh, I'll, I'll start with this question this first question to you someone asks uh, how can the US and NATO best counter uh, the internal Russian propaganda machine? Oh, I think that's very difficult um, because the problem isn't a lack of content. Uh, I think the, uh, there's a lot of content being created in places like the Baltic states, um, in Ukraine and Washington by services like Radio Free Europe and um, in Prague, uh, Radio Liberty, um, that are broadcasting all kinds of information in the Russian language, but it doesn't reach Russian people. So the, 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 first, the first point to actually try to resolve is, how do you make it easy for Russian people to watch um, alternate sources of news? And how do you make the alternate sources of news actually stand up to what is on offer in Russia itself in terms of quality um, and production value? And I don't think anybody's been able to answer that question. No matter how many tens of millions of dollars are dumped into creating Russian language uh, content uh, by countries from the United States to the UK um, to you know, other European powers, they, uh, these, the, this output, uh, for the most part, goes into a vacuum where it's not actually listened to or watched. That's, that's the real problem that needs to be um, resolved. And I think probably one way of changing that, you know, I, I thought at least before the war was possible, would have been to create a um, Russian language source of information or production of Russian language news and, and entertainment content in Ukraine itself, which already has a very big television industry. Um, in fact, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the uh, president of Ukraine, comes from the Ukrainian television industry where he produced a lot of Russian language content uh, as an actor and as the owner of a television uh, production company that was exported all around the former Soviet Union to Russian speakers. And to find ways to um, get that uh, content into, uh, into Russia itself and into other Russian-speaking parts of the former Soviet Union. Um, I think there's been way too much effort spent on figuring out the content and how to make the content, and much too little effort uh, expended on figuring out how to get that content to, uh, to Russian speakers. I think a lot of people would be surprised. Um, you know, they still don't understand how parallel the reality is that people live in who consume Russian news media. Like I was uh, speaking to a friend, um, you know, about this Transnistria piece that I was producing, um, which was filmed several weeks ago before the uh, horrors of Bucha uh, and other parts of the areas Russian, Russians occupied were revealed. And they asked me if the story would really still be relevant, you know, after Bucha, because perhaps the people I spoke to in Transnistria, um, you know, would have had their minds changed. And, and by, you know, by these really terrible things that we saw um, with the executions in Bucha. And I think that this kind of misunderstanding of what people um, think of is happening in Ukraine is, is writ large. Like, if the thing that happened is so awful, it must change your mind. It must have an impact, even if you're in Russia. All that happens is that those same facts are turned around and presented by the Russian news media as something that the Ukrainian fascists did. Each time something happens that we blame on, uh, on Russia uh, and back up by evidence, the Russians just turn it around and blame it on Ukrainians. And Russian media consumers believe that the problems in Ukraine are created by the Ukrainians themselves. No matter what happens, that will never change until the source of information um, is, is different. And so, uh, you know, I think we run into this. We're also... We run into a problem when we start talking about the Russians that are against the war, because a lot of our conversations are with Russians who are against the war. Um, a lot of the people who come to these panels or who we see on American news media channels are people who are against the war. But I don't think they're representative of the thinking that's in Russia. And so we sort of, we actually lull ourselves into this false belief that there are enough Russians um, who are going to rise up and overthrow Putin. Um, because those are the kind of Russians that we engage with on, on a day-to-day, -day, people who are opposed to Putin. But that isn't 
you know, the representative of Russia itself. And of course, what you're what what you're describing here is how disinformation works in every society, right? You could just you could just as easily be talking about the United States uh, right now and the chasms between different sets of facts and. And, you know, we've been through our own several years when people would say, well, this certain thing that happened was so blatant and so horrible that certainly people will see that this was untrue. Uh, and disinformation doesn't, in fact, work like that. And, and in the, as, as Ron pointed out, sort of this struggle for two sets of worldviews or world order disinformation plays a large, large role in this because we increasingly have these very entrenched sets of facts and information systems that are driving uh, people's beliefs and outcomes. Um, Ron, I wanna ask the, the next question to you. Someone, someone asks about China's role in this and what might it take for Chinese media to take a position on Ukraine that that might matter or be influential in some way? China is a very difficult case because China uh, did not want this invasion of Ukraine and was cautious about supporting Putin. On the other hand, like Putin, uh, the Chinese elite also supports a kind of multipolar world. That is, they, they also are in some sense a revisionist power that doesn't like the liberal world order which favors the West and the, the United States in particular. So they're caught in a, in a funny way. So how to deal with media? Well, the Chinese media, like the Russian media, as Elena just told us, uh, is increasingly closing down, uh, becoming less and less open to alternative points of view. Now, China is a gargantuan country and there are within that country all kinds of different points of view, but what can be openly articulated and have effect is diminishing over time. Um, but it's not a foregone conclusion that China has to fully move into the Russian camp and support uh, support Russia altogether. It seems to me that what we might see in the future, in fact, as a result of this war, is in fact different powers, China, India, and even Europe, reconsidering how their interests might be different from and not always consonant with this liberal world order. So that Europe itself might, uh, because European opinion until the war opened in Ukraine was not that unified with the United States. There were, Macron was trying to uh, negotiate with Putin. Uh, Schultz in Germany didn't want to close down the, the Nord Stream 2. What Putin did ultimately was give the, the, the Biden administration everything it wanted by unifying NATO, ending the oil imports uh, more or less from Russia and so forth. But you could see a world that may come out of this, this struggle in Ukraine. And Ukraine, in a way, is a world pivot moment here. This is an amazing moment that will shake up, it seems to me, this world order. It could be that the liberal order will, will reign supreme because everyone will fear Russia and China. Or that people will consider how can we now look at different areas of, of influence spheres of influence and competition between them rather than the, the old way. But I wouldn't put much hope in Chinese media, particularly at this point. We have time for just one more question. Uh, Elena, I'll, I'll put this to you and it has to do with religion. Someone asks, what is the role of religion uh, in this war? And is the Orthodox Church in Moscow portraying this? as a good and just war? Does religion play any role in this? Well, uh, Russian Orthodox Church uh, uh, stands together with Russian authorities and uh, uh, bless the war, like it blessed the war in Chechnya, 
uh, and uh, it brought it brought the crisis in Orthodox Church itself because other uh, Orthodox churches. Uh, I'm not very religious person and not very good at it, but as I know, other Orthodox churches in uh, Ukraine or uh, abroad, they uh, want to bring the Russian patriarch even to tribunal for uh, for this position but uh religious itself the thing that we all uh orthodox people and the easter that is gonna be in a week uh russian orthodox easter is easter for all of us russian ukrainians uh belarusian people uh doesn't play a role in this and the religious is not the thing that would stop russian soldiers of committing those horrible crimes that they do in Ukraine to 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 people. Mm -hmm. So um, no, uh, Russian state uh, controlled Russian church uh, even I would say more than Stalin did uh, because back then the church actually was was among those who were sent to the uh, camps, who were um, put in prisons, who were shot, who were named as enemy of state. And now church people are uh, people who as much corrupted as the Russian authorities and uh, support all crimes and all bad things that Russian authorities do. Hmm. You know, final thoughts from from uh, all of you. Mo most of the time, I think we would like to end a conversation with some thoughts that move us forward. And I think it's impossible in, in this conversation that that we are still in a moment of deep entrenchment with, with no clear way out. Um, Simon, wh where do you see things going next? Well, I think a lot of Ukrainians um, look at it this way. Um, not that I'm a Ukrainian, but I've spent some time there and uh, they see it as, you know, we can drag this war out for a long time at a high cost in Ukrainian lives um, uh, with the level of support that Ukraine has right now. Um, and the outcome could be one that's bad for Ukraine or one that's bad for Russia or the world could band together, throw everything it has into supporting Ukraine right now, uh, defeat Russia, um, and then you know we could go back to the peaceful order that we had before. That's the way things are seen in Ukraine. Um, I think what they're pushing for right now is for uh, energy and an oil embargo and more weapons shipments, um, because they believe that it would be a matter of weeks if uh, Russia was unable, unable to sell its energy to the West uh, before the war would end. It would create, of course, a huge spike in energy prices over the short term, but over the long term, it would be the easiest way out of the situation. That's the view from Ukraine. Elena, is that is that a view that that you see uh, as as well? I'm not very good. Uh, I'm not specialist in this economical uh, situation uh, in terms of embargo of oil and gas. And I think uh, I even uh, if the countries take this embargo right now, uh, it's still will allow Russia to continue uh, war. Uh, so I just, like Ron said, it's it was a huge mistake by Putin because he put himself in a position where he can stop and can, con and, 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 and can continue. And uh, I don't know uh, if any uh, actions like uh, embargo on oil, oil or gas can stop him. Uh, um, the situation is much worse, I think, that, uh, that I, sorry, I don't have any hope. Uh, I think the war will continue. It will take months. Uh, and uh, a lot of people would die. A lot, a lot. 
So I, um, I thank you all for joining us today. I want to point out for people who want to continue this conversation, our colleagues here at the university have been doing um, uh, a number of amazing events. And there's one that's starting right now, immediately following this, Putin's Russia, Imperial Past, Imperial Future. Uh, there's a link in the YouTube chat for those of you who are following us uh, on YouTube. And um, Simon Ostrovsky, Elena Milashina, Ron Suni, we appreciate your expertise and your work. Uh, Simon, we will continue following you on PBS NewsHour and through the New York Times and uh, hope that you continue to travel safely in the region and to bring the news to those of us uh, who are eager to consume it. And Elena, obviously you know that those of us here at Wallace House and all of the journalists watching today um, will be waiting for Novaya Gazeta to resume publication and for you all to continue your work and, uh, and to be able to do that safely. And you are fighting the good fight for all of us who believe in freedom of information uh, and Ron Suni, thank you so much for your perspective and your expertise uh, for this conversation today. Thank you.